William, hey, congratulations for your documentary, Lazaro and the Shark. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. More, more importantly, it's being uh, showcased this weekend at the uh, Doc NYC. How do you feel about that? I feel great. <laughs> I feel great. Uh, you know, the uh, I have to first uh, thank the the festival, Doc NYC, for selecting our film and see its value for the audience and to the world. It's a big platform. So we are really honored. We feel great about it. It's New York City, you know, from all places. The crowd is excellent. I had a couple of, uh, you know, events that we have uh, attended to, and, um, you know, the receptions have uh, been great, and the, the public and the audience response. Is, uh, it's a really great festival to premiere. So we are honored and blessed with the opportunity. And then the whole team feels great. feels great. I encourage people to go to their, our social media, platform to see everybody coming in from Cuba, you know, Europe, you know, the United States, different parts. Uh, the whole team is coming. Uh, we will be celebrating the, the premiere, the world premiere. So I'm very, very, very happy, man. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, <laughs> William, what originated this story that inspired you to do this documentary for yourself? Well, uh, I have uh, a executive producer, Tomas Montoya. I just finished talking to him. He, uh, he's on his way here. He is. Um, he came up with the original idea. And we wanted to document or make a documentary about the Conga parades in Santiago de Cuba. I'm from Havana. He's from Santiago. We met for the first time in New Orleans some 20 years ago. And um, I had been to Santiago maybe like a couple of times in the whole, you know, my whole life while I was in living in Cuba. And then I had seen congas, you know, in the street, on the street parades, and I was mesmerized by it. I was like, wow, man. But then Don Tomas, he grew up there. He grew up around the congas. He grew up, it's, you know, that's his part of his world. And he told me about it. Uh, about it, and uh, he wanted always wanted to make a documentary, but he never had the resources or the know-how or this and that, and you know it was difficult because he was he was living in Cuba. Mm -hmm. So I say, okay, that that's when we started thinking about it and and doing some research and you know development and trying to find funds, which were very unsuccessful at the beginning, like you know, pretty much everybody in any project in life, you know. But, uh, you know, tenacity and, you know, and desire and soul and heart uh, keeping going, like, you know, running a marathon. Mm. And, yeah, we got to this point now. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was it difficult for you to find the subjects of your documentary? And, uh, and was it easy to convince them to be part of this? Um, yeah. It was not, I would like if I say it was difficult because like I say, Tomas from there, they trusted him, you know, and he had some type of relationship with at least some of them, you know, no, but we, mind you, we started with like seven or eight characters and we, you know, reduced the number to three and eventually we added one more. Uh, but many of them didn't make the cut because it was just too broad of uh, the story. Uh, and it was not going to be uh, digestible for a universal audience, you know, maybe for people in Cuba. It was more local, the way that we planned at first. But, you know, through the process of, you know, many years editing and stuff like that, we were able to reduce and manage to do a manageable amount of characters. But going back to your question, um, Mr. Lazaro, it was easy. Um, Lazaro was easy because he was so enthusiastic. So he was so young. And, um, but he was our, last of is the protagonist, but he was our, at the beginning in research and development, he was more like a, a fixer to us, like a producer. He was like, a, he would connect us to different communities, you know, as a local guy who knows the streets and he knows where to go and when the parades are, when the carnival is, and you should interview this person or that guy, or whatever. He was that person for us and eventually, uh, he confessed to me that he really had a, um, a secret love with uh, documentaries and and stuff like that. And I gave him a camera 
you know, I gave him a camera before we left to the U.S. and he was, but then he um, ordered his, his uh, triplets uh, birth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that was significant. And, and I knew from when I found out that his wife was pregnant with triplets, I said, we have to start capturing this situation because we don't have, we don't know where this is going to lead us. And I was so happy to make that decision so, so early. And then, uh, yeah, it was it was really, really a great decision. And then, then we had to convince Tiburon was the, the, the shark was the hardest to convince because of his, obviously, when you see the film, you realize why, because in, in terms of ideology and, you know, and way of life and, you know, worldview that this character has is very unique. No, not unique, but it's, you, you can see why he would be resistant to a filmmaker coming from America to be following him in the way that this documentary is crafted. It's a follow very tale style all the time and look, almost looks like fiction. So I knew what I wanted to do with him, but he necessarily didn't know. He didn't necessarily know, but then, so it took a long time to convince him to get his, his uh, trust and respect. And then one day he said, yeah, let's do it. The poet is a poet, you know, every poet wants to broadcast their poems and, you know, their writing. So yeah, that was really easy. And then, then there's the other character, Nico, um, a, a Cuban American guy who lives in South Florida. That it was, uh, it was easier because he lives in freedom, you know, for m many years. So he was not concerned about that until that part. If you've seen the film, you know that scene that you realize, oh, wow, it hits you and you say, wow, this is deep. In terms of the fear of oppression or fear of losing your freedom, when it hits you and you realize it, it is, it is actually palpable. You say, wow, this is serious. Is, is there anything that I can change? from my actions of what I did. And if it's too late, you have to face the consequences, you know? And no, not everybody is willing to do that. So so the decision to portray the documentary as life of, a, um, you know, as Cubans, Afro-Cubans in these neighborhoods came very, very early on um, for yourself. Yeah. Yes, very early on, yes. That was from the get-go. So, so how do you balance that you know, trying to show their lives with, you know, the, the conga, trying to unite everyone all around this festivities? Uh, well, the good thing about the carnival and the rivalry between uh, neighborhoods and communities, it's only during the carnival, you know, and the carnival is like, what, one week, mm -hmm. seven, ten days maximum. And after that, you know, you see at the beginning of the film when when the protagonist he says, you know, after the carnival is over, especially if you lose, you feel like a vacuum, you know, because you know if you lose the competition in the carnival, but uh, then everything goes down, you know, it's like a calm after the storm, and uh, the city is quiet, and then eventually everybody start going to their own ordinary life, and there's no uh, uh, leftover um, tension. Mm -hmm. The sadness, not only because you lost, but because the carnival is over, the festivities are over. Now we have to wait another year. So, and then, like a week, no, like uh, three weeks before carnival starts, that's when the rivalries and, among neighborhoods and stuff like that start picking up, and then there's a tension in the air. Uh, that you, it's, it's evident the spirit of carnival takes over the whole city. And that's wonderful, wonderful to see a witness and hopefully we capture it. Uh, hopefully we can uh, make the audience feel like they, they are in it, you know. Um, so, yeah, it was not that difficult because it's, it's really contagious and overwhelming. And if, you know, you have the sensitivity and you have camera, you have equipment and you have a, a collective and a team of, you know, people who really want to push the project forward, they they would uh, they would deliver. And I was lucky to have that. So so how long was the uh, the filming uh, part of your uh, production? 
Well, what is in the movie, I'll say, is from 2000, the beginning of 2015 until 2017, like two years. Mm. The rest, we have some stuff that is uh, like a flashback uh, of a couple of characters, a couple of times in the film. And and the rest is just, you know, real time in these two years. And then we have a couple of years edited and then the pandemic, the, the pandemic hit. And then we have to continue doing the post-production, but it was uh, slower because we were going to go for post-production. We were going to go from New Orleans, which is our headquarters, my, me and my, my team. We were going to go to Cuba to finish post-production there with the editor and the sound engineer, the sound track and the sound uh, mastering. But uh, we couldn't travel. So we had to do it all on of the internet, sending files back and forth. You know, you can see with the challenge of the internet in Cuba and the electricity and power and everything and equipment. You know, sometimes you know my my audio engineer he 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 lost a console in the middle of the process. You know, and he had to find what is not like here. You go to Best Buy or whatever you order online and you get the equipment the next day. You know, there you have to, you know, you saw the movie, you see even the, the same things that they have to go through to get stuff for the carnival. Yeah. They have to do the same thing. Technicians, uh, you know, housewives, everybody, you know, anybody you have to do, go to the black market and, you know, try to find it in the, in the only suspected places, some stuff. So, yeah. It, it sounds like a difficult production. Um, what's the filming um, like in, in Cuba? What, was it very strict or it was very free? Uh, no, you, you, have to, you, have, you have to go with the flow. That's been my advice, you know, go with the flow. Don't be uh, disrespectful. If they say, shut it down, shut it down. And uh, it was a different time too, you know, I have to, I be, I have to be, you know, really really sincere about this because because of the technology how fast it's moving 2015 sounds like in, in technology sounds like you know a century ago mm -hmm. you know in terms of the cameras and stuff that you, you could do with cell phones um uh, what, you, what you can do with cell phones now and applications and all that stuff so sometimes it would be um difficult because of the bureaucratic resistance if you choose to go that way. Sometimes for your protection, I mean, as a director, I have to protect my team and the personalities and the people in the community that are giving me their trust to film it. They don't, they know me, but the bureaucracy of the Communist Party, they don't, many of them, the authorities, the policemen, they don't know me. They don't have anything to the reason why to trust me. In fact, they suspect that I am not going to do something bad with this footage to discredit them or the system or communism or whatever, which, you know, at the end of the day, there's only one truth, right? I mean, you know, you see the um, this or that. And the communism happened to be that, you know, which we don't want. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, uh, I don't think the people in Cuba wanted either, but they just thought so, you know, in, in so really caught up in a dictatorship that suppresses all the rights of speech and freedoms of, of any kind and, and stuff. So that's why they are all escaping all the time. Hmm. And uh, I, know, I know it was revealed in the trailer there was a, uh, a police confrontation. I, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've seen the film too, but no one was... No, your your staff and everybody w was completely safe during that process, right? Or, or was it scary? Yeah, we were safe. We were arrested. I was arrested. Uh, Tomas Montoya, the producer, he was arrested during that scene in the film. Um, I was arrested another time, like, you know, a few days later in another similar situation. I was not doing anything, right? I, I, I swear to God, I was just following the chart as I always did every day, you know, religiously, every day, everywhere he goes. I go in behind in the motorcycle with him, filming all the time. He got the mic all the time. 
And that day, for whatever reason, this policeman say, you've been filming this. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, come, take him, take him. I say, what? I say, hey, Chuck, man, just talk to them. Just, uh, tell them I'm not doing anything wrong. I, they say, no, no, he's doing anything. He's, doing. We, he's working with us. We're working in the play. He say, I don't care. Go so take him, take him to the car. They, they took me to the car. They didn't handcuff me right away. I'm in the car, sitting. And I'll be brief with this, but I think people need to hear this. I'm in the car, in the back of the police car, sitting there, but no handcuff or anything. I have my camera here. I say, I'm not going to be respectful or try to film him or anything like that. I'm going to take it easy. I know I was going to be detained in the police station, but I was going to be cool. Because at this point, this is 2017 or 16, everybody in the city knows me and my team. And they know what we're doing. You know, they seen some clips of the film that we have in YouTube or things like that, and we give it to them so the community can feel like we're doing something together. This is serious. It's gonna be a film one day. Just be patient with us, you know. And then um, I'm in the car, and then people in the community start saying, "Hey, William, why are you doing there, man? What happened to you?" And I say, "I'm, you know, I don't know, man." And then the the boss called with a walkie-talkie to the the driver of the car and the other officer, and I say, oh, how come How come this guy is not handcuffed? Handcuff him right now. And I could hear it in the radio. I said, oh, God, here we go. And the guy say, you know, with a lot of pain in his heart, I could see it in his eyes. He said, man, why well, I have to handcuff you? I said, don't do that. He said, bro, listen, I have to handcuff you. Don't let, don't make me do something I don't want to do. I said, oh, go ahead and cut me. I said, he said, no, I put it in your front. I don't know how I put it in the back. I put it in your front. It's probably easy, but let me do it because my boss is on my ass. I said, okay, he do it. And I got to the police station. The policeman there in the bureau, he was familiar with me. He's not my friend or anything like that. He said, oh, I see him all the time. What happened? I said, no, I'm nothing. He said, do you record something compromising? I said, no, man, I can show you the footage. I show him and he said, I go. And he let me go after like two two hours. So that was uh, one time for me. The other time was Tomas. He got uh, detained too for like three or four hours. And then another time we got interviewed for like five hours, five of us. Wow. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That is cer cer certainly a different life uh, for a filmmaker uh, in, in Cuba uh, for, for yourselves. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, it was a challenge in that regard, but it was so um, rewarding. You know, it was so rewarding. We never lost any footage. Thank God. Mm -hmm. All these years, we never lost any footage. We never lost. We never. Nobody was our harm. You know, I mean, there's a scene in the film that you, the people see it. It's really, really, uh, you worry for Lazarus' integrity, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, he, he was all right. You see it at the end of the scene that he, he, he made it. And, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a process. And what, when we finished, Editing and then we have been, in the, you know, these last two months, you know, doing the final touches, you know, like doing another pass on sound and doing another uh, check on color, and uh, making the DCP to the festivals and stuff like that. And the, the subtitles, the credits, really important, <laughs> you know, for everybody to to help, to help, to be to see their name there. It's really really important for me. So people on the appreciate that sometimes. And then, um, and then a couple of musics that we have to change. They were placeholders. We have to put the final thing. Man, um, I realized how there's no excuse for any filmmaker mm -hmm. to not make a film with the resources that we have today. You know, with the technology that we have today. If you have a story in your, in your brain, you think you have the tenacity and the time and you have a, you know, alligator skin to, to take care of uh, 
uh, the critics that are going to come, especially in the early pro process of rough cuts and stuff, the people are going to be brutal with the criticism. And if you can survive that, then keep going. You're going to finish it, and it's going to be probably a good story because everybody has really killer stories to tell. I'm sure you have many of them yourself. Uh, it's all about, you know, making it happen. And it takes a long time for everything that is good. It takes a long time to do it right. Absolutely. Well, one more thing, William. As uh, people get to uh, watch your uh, documentary at Doc NYC and uh, possibly more screening in the future, what is the one most important take you hope that they walk away with after watching your film? Hmm. How important freedom is, how important um, family is, fatherhood, you know. But yeah, most of all, freedom. If you don't have freedom, you don't have anything, man. And before you realize it, it's really, really, really delicate concept mm -hmm. that we take for granted all the time, especially in democracies. We take it for granted. But uh, when you think about it, when you think about this, what I'm saying right now, if you watch the film, this is 63 years, you know, on the one party that mm -hmm. owns a every single thing control including the carnival mm, yeah think about that there is supposed to be a celebration festivity as you said for the people who a carnival man you the origin of the world carnival you just like you get rid of the all the carnival uh scenes of your body and you know before the quaresma before quarantine and christ, christ and all that stuff you're supposed to celebrate life and get drunk and eat and this and that and be exuberant and, you know, and uh, they control that. <laughs> mm. You know, they, they control who wins, who loses, who travels, who eats, who drinks, who has light, electricity, internet. I can't, that's what I'm talking about when I say freedom. People, there is freedom, freedom, what? Freedom from colonialism, from Christopher Columbus. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that. That basic. That people don't think about it. You know, that what you read. <laughs> Who you talk to. That's as simple as that. That's a, the, the type of freedom I'm talking about. I hope that the people get that. You know, this, through the poet, through Lazaro, to Tiburon experience and with Nico experience and everything in the communities and, and the story that we were able to craft using the carnival as a backdrop. I think, I, I hope that people get it. And I and I certainly people will watch, watch uh, Lazaro and and the shark to uh, to get your message. Thank you yeah. very much, uh, William, for uh, speaking to us about the film and uh, yeah. and thank thank you uh, for uh, bringing your art to life. Finally, thank you. So, I want to tell your audience to uh, go to visit the website www.lazaroandtheshark.com. Uh, go to the Dark NYC website and look for the first for the for the film. It's in the in the national competition. Please support every film there, but especially watch Last on the Shark if you can online or in person. We already sold up, uh, one show is sold out for the premiere tomorrow. The other one I think is sold out too. I, I I'm not sure yet, but uh, watch it online in the U.S. and U.S. territories. And go to Instagram, Instagram, you know, web, uh, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, last on the chart, Google, last on the chart. You're going to find us. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.